few of you heard, I so admire her natural ability in front of the remote camera because I don't have it. So I hope that you will all give me a little grace on that feature and we'll focus on the content because I'm not great at having my head on the screen. So the focus today is talking about managing church resources and we're using the COVID-19 situation to frame some of this but we're looking at things that apply beyond just the current situation as well. So one of the first things I want to talk about because it relates to what we're going through is this uncertain time and what do you deal do in a crisis like this or a time of uncertainty that is so unprecedented? A couple of thoughts on that. First, it's a great opportunity while we're quarantined at home and we have a little bit of space to take a deep breath and maybe ask ourselves what we're learning and assess some of the things that we can be gathering information on for the future. So as you're assessing the re responsiveness to this, how responsive were you? Were you ready to adapt to the changing needs? How's communication been? Is there any issues there? Or are there things you can learn from? Also, how about your resources? Were you prepared? <laughs> and that's gonna be a big focus of today. And if not, what kind of things can you do going forward? One of the things, the questions that I came across recently that really summed it up for me was to ask if someone came to you and said, how are you making progress in your mission? What would be the specific evidence that you would point to to validate your answer? So from a church perspective, obviously we want to have a significant impact, but oftentimes that impact is not something that we measure with numbers or other quantitative type of responses. So I want you to ponder that question a little bit to think about how you might respond to that. And we'll look at some examples too as we go along today, because I do think there's ways to potentially measure that. And it's an important way to communicate internally and externally, we are having the impact and the mission that we indicated and that we want to have going forward. So with that being said, let's go ahead and do our first poll question, Emily. So we can see what your current situation looks like and respond to that. So how has the current COVID-19 situation impacted your church? Is there minimal impact, as I'm defining by less than 15% change in revenue sources or contributions? More impact, greater than 25%, but you feel you'll survive because you've got a strong team going and supporting what's going on? Or are you concerned that you might not survive it at all? Great, that's really helpful to know. So I am really encouraged to see that everyone is feeling like they're at least going to survive this but there are some challenges in that middle category for sure. Even challenges in the first one. You may not feel it quite as deeply, but there's challenges in both of those, and that's what we want to work up today. Um, the other thing that I believe this time really highlights is the importance of not ever sitting still and just saying, okay, we're done. And the fact that you're on here, the webinar says to me that you're learning and you want to continue learning and you want to continue growth. And that's an important response to just keep us mission focused and to be able to have the resources to go forward. So to keep learning and responding is an important piece of what we're gonna talk about as well. And then we're also gonna talk about having some what I call guardrails. So as you're doing mystery day to day, how do you know if something is off track or what warning signs or guardrails do you have in place as early alert kind of systems to let you know that maybe more attention is needed in a certain area. So we're gonna go through all of that. And please don't hesitate to use the chat as we talked about as we go along, if you have some immediate questions or something that I can clarify. I love kind of visual, I mean, there's different versions of it, 
but don't you feel like this is often what you're doing is trying to get this balance? How do you create this balance with all of the factors that go into it? When we talk about managing resources, we often think obviously financial. And as a CPA firm, you would expect our focus to be a lot on financial. But financial really is part of a broader system and it does not operate in isolation. And so therefore it's important to look at more holistic elements and look at it as a formula, not an easy kind of solution. So if anybody was hoping that I would give you, you know, 10 points to make sure you stay, <laughs> stay healthy and strong, sorry, that's not what I'm going to do. Because to me, it's much more complex than that. And we will discuss the factors and different things to consider. But you're going to find me giving you a lot more questions than necessarily what would be considered answers. Because it's through the questions that we take what we know internally and we make sure that any solutions fit our particular organization. And there are some things in general we'll talk about, but a lot of it is responding to your individual needs and your individual kind of um, situations. And I wanna to emphasize too that it's not just funding when we're talking about managing resources. It's more, um, it's broader than that. It's not one, piece alone, there really is integration and interrelationship between different pieces. And part of what this opportunity provides as well is a chance to ask some of those tough questions and to have the conversations. So what I'm going to be trying to focus on today is four of those factors. Now this is not a comprehensive list that includes all the factors because there's more to it than just this. But this is kind of the starting point to, to initiate the conversation or initiate the things that you can do to make sure that you are managing your resources effectively and you're planning for crisis times or situations that are uncertain and unexpected like our current COVID um, pandemic. So one of them will be the financial resources for sure. But we're also going to look at how decision making happens within the organization, because that's a real important piece. If you don't have decision making that fits your organization and culture, it doesn't matter what resources you have, because you may not be able to respond in a timely or appropriate manner. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Obviously, one of the keys is always making sure that you're sticking to your mission and specifically how you want to play out that mission in terms of current vision. So we're looking at the questions to consider again, not necessarily providing a set answer because it's going to be an ongoing assessment in your organization. This isn't a one-time assessment either. It has to be continually examined to make sure that you're staying current and that you're adapting to the changes internally and externally. And then the last factor we're going to talk about is time frame. So what are the financial resource considerations? Well, there's lots for sure. But again, I'm only going to touch on some of the more common ones and a few of them. First and foremost, what comes to mind is your current operating reserves. If you have been proactive in planning, hopefully you've had some time to build up an operating reserve. Most of the time, the recommendation is that those operating reserves are somewhere between three and six months of operations. Now, if you're in a fortunate position to have that, that's definitely going to help you see through this time and weather that drop in revenue stream. If you don't have the, the fortunate situation of having those operating reserves, Here's a chance again to go back and learn from the situation as to what should our operating reserves be? Is three months sufficient? What do we want? What's most important to us if we get in a situation like this for using those? Is it keeping people employed, meeting mission? How do we measure and use those operating resources? Or are we just in survival mode at the moment? And there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, we talked about that as a group on last week, as well as um, internal conversations. 
that a lot of what we have to do right now is survive. So again, having those internal questions and discussions though on what are our reserves, what's our anticipation, what would we like to see. The next one to consider is the predictability. Now in talking to some of the churches that I work with, they are obviously used to having a lot of the contributions come in on Sunday morning in the church. So what do you do when you're not physically there and you can't collect those? So they've been real successful in um, gearing up online or optional other ways, like even just traditional mail, to get those resources still to the church and supporting their church during this time. But without even being in crisis mode, how do you know the predictability of your future funds? A couple of things to consider here. One, do you use pledge cards? If you use pledge cards, that can potentially help you understand maybe fluctuations that are likely to happen based on individual family or contributor circumstances. You also might be able to have some predictability element if you are looking at past trends of giving. And we would encourage you to keep trends um, of giving on a couple of different factors by time, because obviously there is some seasonality to giving within the church, as well as if applicable or if you can measure it by attendance, because that again will tell you somewhat about the impact in terms of predictability for the future, as well as um, the impact of what you're having in terms of generosity part of your mission. So those are a couple of options for that. If your future funds are highly unpredictable, then obviously you need some kind of backup plan as to what are we gonna do if we sit in a situation like this? How do we meet the current needs to weather the storm and come out healthy on the other side? Now, some of those things could be back to the operating reserve, but there are other options. Um, one of them is a line of credit. If you don't have sufficient operating reserves or depending on your church situation, a line of credit is a great option to have available so that you can weather those short-term storms. Also, as we know, through this particular storm, we've been looking to some of the government resources. Currently, if you haven't heard, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you have heard, that the payment protection money has run out and the EIDL, SBA funding for the emergency or economic injury disaster loan, they're currently not taking applications any longer for that either. But stay tuned, there was plenty of discussion over the weekend about further funding and other resources. And we will do our best to stay right on top of all of that and communicate what we know. Now, another thing to consider as a financial resource is your property and equipment. If you have your own building, there's obviously a resource right there. And that can provide some leveraged financing, if you will, um, in times of need, or maybe it already does have a debt element. But the other thing to consider with the property and equipment is this is more of what I would call a long-term item than a short-term. So as we're assessing our financial resources, we have to look at what those short-term commitments are versus the longer-term commitments. And if I have a building, I have a long-term commitment because I might have a mortgage. Even if I don't, I'm gonna have maintenance issues and I'm gonna have a difference in daily operational spending to maintain that property. Here, again, you might want to set some benchmarks or guardrails to measure how that's doing and monitoring whether or not you're staying on track. And one of the ones that I think would be a good measure here is to take your total operating costs related specifically to maintaining and keeping the property compared to total expenses for one that will tell you the volume that every dollar in the door has to be allocated to property and equipment, maintenance and um, usability. The other comparison might be 
against revenues or attendance or number of times the building is used. Um, I love that some churches make their buildings available for other organizations. And one of the ways you can potentially use that property and equipment for the greater good is by doing that, opening your doors. So maybe you measure those costs as part of unofficially mission kind of things to the community because you're providing resources to those in need in terms of space. So that's one consideration. The other is a trusted advisor. And what I mean here is somebody who has a comfort level with all things accounting and finance. Not everybody likes this topic and we all have our strengths and gifts. Again, Emily and I were talking early on today my gifts are not hers and vice versa and we're thankful for that because we both we need both of them but oftentimes the advisor from a financial accounting perspective is seen as the roadblock or the no person and if you have somebody in that role who first answer to a question is generally well no or i'm not so sure about that then maybe you either need to have a conversation or potentially build the relationship or realign to a new relationship. Because the key to this person, it could be someone on staff, it could be a treasurer, it could be a finance committee member, it could be an outside provider. But the key to it is to have somebody who is trusted in terms of their expertise, but also trusted in terms of their collaboration. Are they willing to, to take the time to really listen, understand how that proposal might work with the mission, and then take a step back and say, okay, I like that in terms of our mission, but give me a, a little bit to consider the potential risks or monetary impact. That's a fair statement because now it is not just an automatic no, and there's that trusted advisor role coming out where you have more of a participatory relationship in the decision making and at the table than just kind of that roadblock or endpoint where, okay, now we want the funds. And the better that relationship and the more trusted that person is or people are, the sooner they're likely to be looped into those kind of conversations. And one of the things we're gonna talk about in several places today is that broader perspective. Whenever we make decisions or we look at managing our resources with tunnel vision and with limited expertise, I don't believe that we're doing our best with the resources we've been provided. We are given different perspectives and viewpoints and talents for a reason. So to be a trusted advisor and member of the team <clears throat> can be an important piece of that. Another thing to consider is do you have donor restrictions? So if you have a great cash account, but half of that is restricted by donors as to a specific purpose, you need to factor that into the consideration of what do we really have available for emergencies? What do we really have for response time? So make sure that that's clear. And that in itself is a big issue too for churches, just to track them and make sure that you are acknowledging and following the things that the donors have asked you to do with their funds. And we could have a whole, we do have <laughs> whole webinars and conversations just on that topic. So we won't spend more time there at the moment. Another consideration is what's your life stage? If you're fairly new, there's not the same kind of predictability, obviously. You're also not as likely to be mired in a lot of fixed costs. You probably don't have as much staff. You probably don't own a building. So those are considerations that maybe make you a little bit more nimble and adaptable when it comes to a crisis situation. It also potentially puts you at further risk though because you don't have the reserves or haven't had the time to build the reserves and the relationships. If you're later in your life stage, you maybe have established some of those reserves and you have some predictability. But flip side, you likely also have maybe a bigger payroll and property costs. 
So those are things to consider when you're looking at what you have available and how you can respond to different situations. And along with that is something I've been alluding to here is the fixed cost. From an accounting standpoint, fixed costs is nothing more than a cost that you can't change in the short term. And for accounting purposes, we generally think of that as a year. So if I can't easily change that cost within a year, it's a fixed cost that I need to take into consideration when I'm doing some of this kind of planning and managing so that I know what I can adapt and flex in the short term in response to a situation versus what I can't. And the biggest fixed cost likely is going to be your payroll. So you want to understand that and have that commitment because I believe also that part of your mission is to your employees. So you want to make sure that you can cover that in a short term and factor that in as a fixed cost. Now, some of it may be more what we would associate as variable if some of your personnel is on a limited term basis or only works when needed or is part time. So those are other options to consider. The other big place the fixed cost comes in obviously is with property and debt. If you have either of those, you are likely to have more significant fixed costs and less ability to adapt and flex in the short term. And then as you're doing this planning, <laughs> I think we all need to be continually watching what financial storms are and doing those risk assessments. The risks continue to change and evolve as well over time. I don't know, um, I'd love to hear how churches how well they did in predicting potentially some of this. Um, but those things are important to consider because there are things that are more likely to be happening in the near future and you want to respond to that. Now, I want to know what your resources include. So Emily, would you please put up our next poll? So check all of them that apply here in terms of your church resources. Do you have at least three months of operating reserves? Do you have a building without debt? How about an endowment fund? Limited or no donor restrictions? How about your revenue sources? Are they fairly diverse or is it just Sunday giving? And then do you actually have some risk minimization strategies that you've discussed and put in place? So what do we look like, Emily? Very interesting. I am really pleased to see that so many of you have operating reserves. That speaks very well to your um, management of resources and intention to be sustainable long term. Um, looks like you have a number of other resources as well. Now, the one I want to highlight here is the one that the most have is the endowment fund. An endowment fund can be both um, donor restricted or internally restricted and it's important to know which it is for your church or organization because that changes your flexibility and ability to adapt with those resources. An endowment fund that has donor restrictions cannot be touched, period. If it is an internal endowment, you go back to how you've set those parameters internally, and you may have a little bit more flexibility. And I put this in the poll intentionally versus the slide because this is often something people really rely on and have on their balance sheet, and it's a great resource. But the thing with this resource is it's generally not real flexible or adaptable. It helps with long-term, but we need to factor in when we're assessing those risks and looking at financial resources in terms of response to given situations, that that endowment fund is not likely to be one of the funds that we can rely on in a short-term crisis. So thank you, Emily, I appreciate that. In terms of um, risk minimization, there's a number of things. Um, but one of the things I wanted to just highlight that came to my attention during this is business interruption insurance 
if you have that or if you've ever considered it, make sure that you understand what it covers. Because after the SARS epidemic, um, a lot of the policies do not cover communicable disease outbreaks. So in this case, COVID might not even be covered under a business interruption. And again, you want to just make sure that you understand what you have. All right, let's look at decision making. So the first question I have is who's involved in budgeting? Now, if you're like a lot of organizations, if you are not the accountant or somebody involved in accounting, you're like, I don't want a piece of the budget. <laughs> That's their job. My personal viewpoint on this is everybody to be involved in budgeting. Because you're a team, because you want to be collaborative and holistic, because most positions can either help to bring in resources, resources or spend those resources, they should be involved in the budgeting process. So this right there tells me, first and foremost, kind of the situation you've set within your organization by knowing who's involved in the budgeting process. If it's more diverse and widespread, that indicates that there's more shared responsibility and back to that collaborative approach. And where finance or accounting may be seen more as a trusted advisor than just that magician who's able to put the budget together and magically create those reports and make everything look happy. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could just take situations and turn them around like that? Um, again, it's more of an advisory kind of position, something that can just happen without that involvement. So I think it's important to have people involved in budgeting. The next one is how decisions are made. Now, it depends on the decision, obviously, because there's times when a centralized decision is most appropriate, especially when it comes to big outlays of cash or time or major issues. But a lot of the decisions should be potentially decentralized and go along with that budgeting aspect. If we are involving and empowering everyone within the organization to have some say in how those resources are spent, then we should trust and have that decision making more decentralized and align with budget so that they can also see then the direct response to how things are spent. The realization with that, those two pieces though involved is to again, acknowledge the comfort level or discomfort level that many have when it comes to budgeting. And these are not things that you're gonna be able to do just automatically or overnight, but something to consider for longer term management and involvement of creating that collaborative team and getting the different voices heard. Then as I was saying earlier, that financial advisor when are they a part of the decision process? Is it early on or is it at the tail end? The earlier the financial advisor can be involved in the process, obviously, <clears throat> in my mind, the more informed the decision can be, the less potential roadblocks that will be encountered down the road, and the more streamlined, potentially time-wise, that the process can go because there's time to address the different perspectives up front rather than having gone so far with one intentionality, one perspective and viewpoint, then have it later shifted by another. And as I said earlier, I do believe that that financial advisor is best serving the church when they are willing to be somewhat flexible and adaptable and look at things from different perspectives, not just be holding on to the resources which a lot of us want to do to be protective, but to, instead being sharing that expertise and asking the right questions. Be the person who's prompting the decisions, um, decision-making process with the right kind of questioning as we're going along. To do the kind of things I'm talking about, you've got to have clear expectations. If the employees don't understand what's expected of them and have a clear expectation, of what that means, then it gets derailed early on and it's not gonna be as successful. So that's one of the things to consider right up in terms of decentralizing and empowerment. Is the decision an example or is it permitting what is good to stand in the way of what could be great? So oftentimes when we get caught up in doing day to day, 
we get caught up in just doing life or doing ministry or wanting to accomplish the next goal or currently just surviving. And so sometimes do those decisions become an example of I'm getting by or I just have to be good instead of being what's great. And there's a time place for all of those. But it's good to acknowledge when it's not necessarily going towards great. And if it is a short-term situation requiring a short-term answer, it's very different than if I'm approaching a longer-term financial decision and I want to gear and take the time for it to be great, not just good. So it's important to consider those as you're looking at it up front. And then this should go without saying, and we're going to spend some more time on it here in a minute, but does the decision align with mission? And unfortunately, again, we often get caught up and we're busy. Um, and when we're busy, sometimes things just go status quo without taking that moment to step back and say, does this still align with mission? Because communities change, priorities change, and potentially while the mission we stay the same to serve a community or to be the hands and feet or whatever that mission is, but how it plays out may look different in response to how the environment around the church is changing. So it's important, again, to have some intentionality around knowing whether that decision still aligns with mission. So we're going to move, um, or actually before we move forward in dis into the next step. Can you put up the third poll? So I wanted to um, get a perspective from you on your organizational structure. Do you feel your structure allows you to adapt quickly? And again, you can check apply. Does your structure facilitate clear communication and expectations? Do you respond slowly to identified issue? How about collaboration? Does the structure encourage collaboration within the church, with other churches or other service organizations? And then lastly, does, um, do you centralize for all decisions just for consistency? This will help us kind of get an assessment as to where this particular community on our webinar today is. Thank you, Emily. All right, very interesting. I thrill to see that you can adapt quickly. So many of you can adapt quickly because in a given circumstances and the way our world functions today, change is so rapid that that's an important element of your strategy and ongoing considerations. Um, there seems to be an element of opportunity potentially for some organizations here in terms of communication. What I have seen in working with a number of different organizations during this time of pandemic is the importance of communication. And it should be a no-brainer. We talk about it plenty. But again, sometimes we get lost in things and we don't take a step back to really assess it. So if you did not respond positively to that question, there's one of those things that I would know as a learning opportunity for going forward. Um, now, centralizes all the decisions. I'm not going to judge there because, one, it's fine to judge, but two, I don't know the complexity or structure of all your organizations. Depending on size and mission, there are times that. Just understand that when you centralize decisions, you've also taken away some of the diversity of thinking and flexibility of potentially responding so it's important to then balance that and consider the pros and cons to having more of a centralized making process. The one I'm thrilled with is that encouraging collaboration. One of the trends that even before the pandemic, we've been seeing more and more is collaborating with other churches and or other service organizations not just about being a standalone organization and trying to solve things, from a nonprofit world perspective as a whole, what I often see is people with a passion and wanting to start something new and solve a problem, but there's really something already out there that addresses part of the problem, if not all of the problem, 
and why not collaborate? And a church has so many things that they're called to be and do, and you can't be and do all of them well. So where are the places that you can partner with other organizations to do those pieces that we're called to? So awesome information. Thank you for sharing that. All right. In terms of mission and value considerations, the first thing is to know what's your story. And one of the ways I like to encourage people to assess how well they're communicating their story is if you ask an employee, what's our values or what's our mission? Could they reiterate to you? What about somebody in the congregation? Could they tell you what the mission and vision are and what you're about? If that's not clearly defined and it's not clear what your story and your mission is, then it's harder to even measure that impact or like I challenged at the beginning to come up with ways to show quantitatively how you're impacting that mission and how you're achieving what you say you're going to achieve. So that's the first thing I like to say. One, to look at your spending in alignment with mission. So one of the things that a lot of resources that talk about church spending and church resources will say is to look at your expenses and the percentage of different expenses as compared to the total. So let's say, for instance, that part of your mission is global outreach. If I look at your expenses and I see expenditures for global outreach being maybe 2% of total expenses, does that align with the mission? If you say that you're about community service, is there an expenditure line item and are there things and resources being put towards local outreach and local spending or supporting local partners? So it's a great way, again, back to that budgeting and collaborative piece of looking at if you're living out what you think you are in terms of how those dollars are being spent. And there's always more to the story than I'm making it appear here, because remember, this is limited time and, and I have to simplify it to a certain extent. I realize there's broader complexities, but I'm trying to call us back to a few of the basics as well and help us look at those pieces to be able to do that honest assessment and see where we're at. When we're assessing new programs, do they support mission or has our mission shifted? Now, there's nothing to say that mission couldn't shift over time. They're in response. One of the things that for-profit organizations are really good at is what's called disruptive innovation. Instead of taking status quo, they look to new ways to basically disrupt the status quo with something new. And there's so many examples with the gig economy and other situations where that disruptive innovation has then become part of the normalcy of daily operations. So your mission is generally pretty set, but maybe it was set 150 years ago, and there is time to update that. But then once you have a clear mission on that, do the programs you want to support align with that? I was talking to a client this morning about their mission, and they have a generous and they wanted to step in and do something for um, a community organization, a food bank, but it doesn't align with anything in their mission at all. And so we discussed the best ways to potentially promote and encourage supporting that food bank, and yet not taking it on as a direct responsibility because it's not part of their direct mission and it's not part of what they normally do as an organization. So it's being able to answer and ask those kind of questions. This is an important one from managing resources. We all have a tendency to want to help. If you weren't one of those people, it's unlikely that you would be in ministry or you'd be in ministry for very long because we want to be the hands and feet and we want to be helpful. So one of the things, again, to assess on a regular and intentional rotation is looking at evidence of mission creep. It's great to sometimes do the short-term fixes, like the organization I talked to this morning, wanting to help if nothing at all wrong with that. But where is it short-term in response to a crisis versus mission creeping into something that we did not intend 
in the first place and or that there's other resource providers could potentially address that need better than we could. So can you please put up our fourth poll question it's where we can look at your response in terms of mission. So in response to changes that have been brought on by this COVID situation, are you continuing existing community groups via online tools or other resources? Are you using this time to create new communities? Are you providing new outreach opportunities within your church? How about participating in opportunities to collaborate again? And we saw very favorable on that one, so I would expect to see some there. And then lastly, are you providing online ways to welcome visitors? One of the things as you finish responding to this question I have found very interesting this is more anecdotal just from individual churches, a strict survey, is how many people are tuning into a church online that have never gone to church before in their life. So I think this is a great opportunity to acknowledge that and to consider that as part of our response. All right, how'd we do, Emily? Awesome. Everybody's continuing their community. Isn't it a blessing that we have some tools and we can adapt to that? That's a really cool thing. There's also a large number of you that are adapting to new communities. And I think that's wonderful because there are more people seeking and looking for connections. And it's hard. You feel isolated during this time. So it's great that we can facilitate and potentially create some of those new communities. And then that last one, I am so happy and I applaud all of you who are welcoming and making ways to welcome visitors and encourage their interaction with your church. So way to go, you're on track. <laughs> all right. So the last factor in frame considerations. Some things are gonna be short term, some are longer term. Some of the ones that we think are short term may have an unforeseen long term consequence. So one of the first things we want to consider is the long term impact. The impact may be financial. It may be that we're accomplishing mission. That's going to tell us a little bit about, if you will, in terms of a for profit business, the return on the investment. So if it has a longer term impact, it's probably a bigger or better expenditure because it's meeting mission and it's doing what we want it to do versus something that may not have the significant long-term impact. So that's one way of looking at the time frame. My favorite and most important thing to consider when I'm talking about time frame is what we're using for our information. As accountants, myself included, we tend to look at historical information. <laughs> Why? because we can quantify it and it's a known factor. But while it can help guide our thinking and frame our thinking, we cannot take that as the piece of information that's the ultimate tipping point for a decision. Because as we've seen in this crisis, things can change very rapidly. And that historical information may not be relevant six months, a month later, depending on and whatever. The other important piece out of the looking at and using that historical information is to help develop internally and back to having more of a holistic and broader team, developing what I call prospective thinking so that everybody is thinking bigger picture and longer term or impact for the investment of time, energy, money, whatever it is in terms of impact to accomplishing the mission. So those are great factors to consider when you're looking at those historical pieces. But remember, it's about guiding and in, in developing that prospective thinking. Forecasting is something that can be very risky, but the pro to forecasting, and forecasting is a little different, by the way, than budgeting. Budgeting is more determining and communicating our financial plan for the next period. Forecasting allows us to look at some alternatives and to consider some different potential opportunities and to proactively assess those options. 
So if we were in normal, you know, non-pandemic situations and we were looking at expanding to another site, a forecast would be a great way to look at what are the potential scenarios and responses to that and are those dollars then meeting impact and what we would anticipate is in alignment with our mission. These are things that you can, with obviously the resources available today, that aren't that hard to do. Um, we often use some historical information to do that forecasting, but the forecast can help you say, okay, simplified three levels. Here's what potentially worst case scenario might look like. Here's what best case scenario might look like and what we consider the most likely outcome. So again, it informs your decision and it brings more to the table. This cannot be overemphasized. We've been talking a lot of big picture, but cash flow is so important. If you have this lovely building and you have great people and you have great decision making, but you don't have the cash flow to pay the payroll, that's a problem. <laughs> so most organizations look at this more regularly and more frequently than some of the other considerations, and it should be. The cash flow impact should be considered um, more on a short-term basis, as well as the long-term fluctuation that it may cause if it is a long-term investment. And that cash flow, it can be very different from the other pieces that we're measuring, but it's important to have that available. And back to the, the, one of the earliest points we talked about is if you don't have those reserves, then how are you gonna get that cash in? Potentially a line of credit or something else that can then, um, potentially help. And then as I already mentioned, that prospective financial thinking, because what we're really aiming towards is having people participative and um, thinking pro proactively and um, thinking into the, the future, but with the financial resources and the overall church resources and the best ways to accomplish mission in regards to that. Now, a few other considerations here as we get um, close to our, our wrap up time. Again, there's so many factors and we're, we're really scratching the surface. I don't wanna minimize that it's a complex situation but hopefully we're giving you a few things to consider. And this is a time when you're recognizing how adaptable and flexible and resilient you really are. Um, from what I've laid out today, in most cases, it helps to have that flexibility and adaptability if everyone in the organization is on the same page. And to simplify how I'm going to talk about it, I'm gonna talk about it as a holistic culture, what I call a holistic culture, where people are involved and trusted in making those decisions. They're involved in the budgeting and they understand wanting to maximize impact, et cetera. If I am in a situation where that's what I wanna do and have that holistic kind of culture and involvement, then obviously having financial information is important. So is it transparent and available to everyone internally? One of the, the fun points for me when I'm teaching sometimes is to ask a group how many of them hand out their financial statements to every employee or make it available at least to every employee. And invariably in every group, there's somebody who's like, why would I do that? <laughs> and my question or my response back to that question is because how can they know what their impact is and where the current situation financially is for the organization if we don't share that information? You can determine the level of detail and you can determine you know, when and how, but I think it's an important authenticity and, and transparency piece to make that available and it's gonna improve those decisions and the usage of resources if we're all on the same page. Then as you go throughout the organization, you may have different areas. And those different areas know how they're impacting the bottom line. Okay? It might be easy for the children's coordinator to know their impact. They're touching on lives and doing amazing things. But is it as easy for the, um, the janitor or the bookkeeper or the receptionist to say, oh yeah, this is how my job and what I'm doing every day impacts our bottom line as well as our mission. 
So again, connecting those dots and having that community and collaboration is going to accomplish more than operating isolated or independently. So it's important to know the importance and the value because you wouldn't have them on staff if they didn't have value and they weren't adding to the overall mission. So it's important to communicate that and look at it. And then I've been alluding to a number of times these key indicators. Now you could call them key performance indicators. I called them guardrails earlier, um, benchmarks. There's different labels that potentially can be put with it. But the key is that you've identified some things that will help you know both short-term and long-term, how you're doing. Um, are we staying on track? Do you have those things that say, hey, wait a minute, contributions are slowly going down and we need to adapt our response? Or is it a year later when you don't have the finances to pay payroll that you realize, oh, our contributions have been going down for the last year, year and a half. So it's about identifying sooner, obviously, rather than later, so that you can respond appropriately and quickly and adapt to those changes as you're going through. Um, the other big thing that I didn't put in here is a bullet point, but I like to point out, and it's one of my pieces, obviously, you can probably tell from my title of, of training. Um, I believe in ongoing learning and the willingness to make mistakes. Um, none of us are perfect, we're a work in progress. So are we willing to be transparent and authentic about making mistakes both individually and corporately? And then that authenticity and transparency can allow us to really learn from it and take forward that we're gonna benefit from that mistake versus just having to deal with the, the consequences or the fallout. The other thing I want to add here at the end is having what I term, for lack of a better phrase, authentic communication. And what I mean by that is that it is not just dialogue one direction. It's not pushing information out. Communication involves multiple parties in both sides. And if you have really good internal authentic communication, I think that means that multiple voices and ideas are being heard. If consistently you have a few voices that are heard versus the broader perspective, that may impact your decisions. You may not be getting the whole story. You may not see everything that you need to consider in making the optimal decision or in the best way to manage those resources. And then I know I've kind of alluded here, like keep thinking lastly, and then one more thought pops in here, um, is to be honest about some of the barriers that potentially can stand in the way of some of this. We all have fears. <laughs> one of the big things that um, has become very apparent in the situations I've been talking in and um, people I've talked to just today is the level of uncertainty and apprehension stress and fear potentially that comes out of situations like this. But in other circumstances, there may be other things that when we're having a conversation internally or about a particular mission or impact, that strikes different people differently, obviously. Um, it's fear or it trips something that they're super passionate about or that they have much more knowledge and in-depth experience with. So the ability to foster that kind of, again, communication and acknowledgement of those barriers is going to facilitate the information that comes out of it and optimize the resource spending and the decisions. Here is our general um, links to different social as well as my personal link. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I will look at the Q&A and respond to those as needed. Um, anything else that you wanted to add, Emily, as we wrap up? I don't think so. I so appreciate everybody for joining us today. If you do have any questions, please throw it in that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll reach out to you. Um, look on our website and our emails for our upcoming event. We have a lot of great information heading your way. Um, I think that that's all that I have. Any last words, Melody? Nope. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for all of your expertise and your time. Um, thank you.
all again, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.